have a responsibility to their staff and they can help them do that? Well, as well as the initiatives that uh, the Departments of Health and Education have brought forward about schools and colleges, people in hospitals, there are many other settings in which we need to combat period poverty. The workplace uh, is uh, just one of those, and that is the purpose of the task force. So we're going to be talking to all employers, public and private sector. Day. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with permission, I would like to answer question 7 with questions 9 and 13. Uh, the Government of the day decided more than 20 years ago that it was going to make state pension aid to save for men and women in a long overdue move towards gender equality, and this change was clearly communicated. We need to raise the age, uh, age at which all of us can draw state pension so it remains sustainable now and for future generations. Hey. Thank you. We know from House of Commons library data that the number of women aged 60 claiming out of work benefits has increased from 2013 more than any uh, among the total number of claimants of all other ages. Yeah. So, what further evidence do we need for that this UK government has totally failed this cohort of women? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, uh, I, I'm sure the honourable gentleman will, will acknowledge that uh, additional money uh, was put into the system, uh, an extra £1.1 billion was put in, uh, and this means that uh, uh, women who are, find themselves in this cohort will benefit. Alan Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The fact that as 1950s born women suffer discrimination, lower pay, leading to smaller or no pens, private pensions to fall back on. Is it beggars' belief they then had to suffer to an equalisation of state pension age? Mm -hmm. given, the lack of, given the past injustices, the lack of notification in 1995 Act and the way 2011 Act has been rolled out, who in this government is going to take responsibility for fair transitional arrangements? Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I said, uh, additional money was put into the system, uh, but ultimately this is a question of fairness between generations, and uh, we need to make sure that we keep the state pension sustainable, and of course we have to reflect improvements in life expectancy. Linden. Yeah. Yeah. I've not been lost in the chamber that the Minister has again repeated the myth that these changes were quote, clearly communicated. Yeah. The DWP Select Committee in 2016 said that the Department did not live up to its expectations and that the communication was very limited. So can the Minister genuinely look us in the eye and say that he thinks that he did communicate this to women and didn't put them up the garden path? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, at risk of repeating myself, I think this is a question of making sure this is a question of making sure that we are uh, making clear that we have provided extra support, but this is a question of fairness, and I know the Honourable Gentleman will want to make sure that intergenerational fairness is something that is reflected in these changes. Bambus Charalambus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last summer, our female offender strategy set out priorities for supporting women at risk of entering the criminal justice system. As part of that strategy, we will be publishing a national concord act shortly, setting out how public services should cooperate to protect these vulnerable women. Ambos, Charles Ambos. The number of prison officers leaving within a year of starting their role has dramatically risen since 2010. So what are the government doing to ensure that prisons have experienced staff to assist female prisoners who often have complex needs? And what steps is the government taking to support women's centres who play a huge role in preventing vulnerable women from entering the criminal justice system? I have two questions for the fighter. One which I will seek to answer. As he will know, we are recruiting significant numbers, over 2,000 more prison officers, but also significantly increasing our spending on women's centres to make sure every police and crime commissioner area now has a centre. Yes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As it is currently a welcome reform of probation services ongoing, now is the time to be looking at how we can improve delivery of these services. Will the Minister commit to looking at making specialist gendered support, such as women's centres, female drug rehabilitation clinics and women's refuges, mandatory as part of the probation services across the country? Well, she makes an important point. We know that women leaving prison have a range of quite distinct needs. They have higher reoffending rates than men. 39% go into unsettled accommodation. A third are not allowed to work benefits a month after leaving prison. There are a wide range of issues we need to look at. And I will take her point on board seriously. All number ten, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr Speaker, all employees with 26 weeks continuous service have the right to request flexible working. This accounts for over 90 per cent of the employees. We will consult on a creating a duty for employers to consider whether a job can be done flexibly and to make that clear when advertising. We have also established a flexible working task force with business groups, employee representatives to promote wider understanding and the implementation of flexible working practices. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Uh, lots of women working in industries like retail can often return from maternity leave to find that they are withheld from progressing in their careers because uh, their new care responsibilities is interpreted as a lack of flexibility. What more can this government do to challenge this sort of short-sighted behaviour in a minority of employers? Well, I thank my honourable friend, and I note his expertise in the re retail sector before being elected to this House. The retail sector gender pay gap is 9.1%, compared to 17.9% overall. But government's not complacent. The sector continues to take steps to tackle gender equality, including the British retail consortium's Better Retail, Better World. This has seen more than 30 leading businesses commit to reducing inequality as part of the sector's contribution to sustainable development goals. The 12, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The Equalities Act 2010 makes it unlawful to discriminate against employees, people seeking work based on race. The government is committed to a society where everyone can enter work and progress on merit regardless of their background, and that is why the Prime Minister launched a consultation on mandatory, mandatory ethnicity pay reporting alongside the new race charter. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer, Mr Speaker, but 35% of black and ethnic minority workers in the West Midlands have been encouraged to adopt a Western work name by their boss at least once in their career, which is a truly shocking and unacceptable state of affairs in 21st century Britain. So what more is the Minister prepared to do in order to stamp out such discrimination in the workplace for BME workers? The Honourable Lady is uh, quite right, and uh, let's be clear, discrimination of any kind within the workplace is not tolerated and, in some, uh, and, and unlawful in some cases. The Prime Minister, who has had a strong commitment uh, why she introduced um, the uh, mandatory ethnicity pay reporting consultation, but I would also like to highlight to the Honourable Lady that the Business Diversity and Inclusion Group, um, which looks at these issues, what I just shared recently, um, very much want to make sure that anybody in the workplace will not be discriminated because of their colour or gender. Order. Topical questions. Martin Day. This year's Pride takes place at a time when LGBT issues are firmly in the public consciousness. It is a reminder. 50 years on from the Stonewall riots in New York, that Pride is just as important today as it was then. Still today, LGBT couples fear holding hands in public. Still today, LGBT people are the victims of prejudice and violence. And still today, some people think it is inappropriate to teach children that other children might have two mums or two dads. I would ask all members of this House to support Pride in the coming weeks and to continue to work towards equality for all. Women overwhelmingly bear the brunt of domestic work, averaging 10 hours per week more on household work than men, and the ONS have estimated this at a value of £1.24 trillion. Pounds. That's more than the UK's retail and manufacturing sectors combined. So what work is the Department doing to quantify and value this household work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Honourable Gentleman makes a very important point. We have been working on, as he will know, a women's economic empowerment strategy which looks at uh, a woman at every stage of her life and all of the responsibilities uh, that they take on at each stage of their life and the impact that has on their financial and physical well-being. We will publish this strategy very shortly. Latham. What, what is the Minister doing to help girls reach their full potential in light of being taken from school at this time of year at or below the age of 16 for early marriage abroad? Well, 
May I thank the May I thank my honourable friend in her unrelenting campaign to ensure that this issue is brought before the House. Uh, forced marriage is a terrible form of abuse. This government and this Prime Minister has made protecting women and girls from violence and supporting victims of forced marriage a key priority. We have introduced a range of measures to tackle this crime, including creating a specific forced marriage offence and criminalising the breach of forced marriage protection orders. Dawn Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, earlier one of the ministers said that they were unfamiliar with some of the comments made by the Conservative candidates. I'd like to do my public duty. The right honourable, the right honourable member for Isha and Walton has refused to lift NDA agreements with women that he's entered into and wants to abolish the government's equality office. The right honourable member for Uxbridge and South Roslip referred to black people as pickaninnies and Muslim women who wear the niqab as letterboxes and bank robbers. The right honourable member for Tatton says there's a problem with kids learning about LGBT+. The right honourable member for South uh, Northamptonshire says having children makes her a better PM. The right honourable member for Broomsgrove said he did not condemn all people Files. And finally, the Secretary of State's preferred candidate, the Right Honourable Member for South West Surrey, who is going to halve the abortion limit to 12 weeks. In light of all this, will the Secretary of State confirm whether equalities will progress or regress under the new Prime Minister? Well, first of all, can I say that uh, I would just gently point out that uh, the accusation she makes against my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, it was under his tenure that the scheme for Northern Ireland was introduced and funded from the England NHS budget. And I would say to the, very gently to uh, the honourable lady opposite, she might like to concentrate on her own side's uh, Qualities, and I would encourage uh, the side opposite. Uh, we have had two female prime ministers. In a few weeks, we may have our third. I would encourage uh, the benches opposite to uh, get their own act together before casting aspersions on ours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government intends to require businesses to consider whether a job can be done flexibly. flexibly. But will my right honourable friend argue for flipping that question so jobs are flexible by default and employers must make the case for any job not to be flexible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I thank the honourable lady, um, and of course, uh, flexible working is important to men um, just as much as women when they seek to strike that balance between family life and a career. I thank her for her welcoming of her intention to consult on the duty to employers to require uh, jobs to be advertised if they can be. Uh, flexible. Uh, the government will not, uh, is not considering uh, making all jobs flexible. But I would like to tell her this morning I spoke at the CIPD um, talking at the Festival of Work, and the topic of conversation was very much how we make flexible working in the future the norm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Despite York being a human rights city, the gender pay gap has increased since 2010 by a staggering 225%, with women being predominantly in low pay, part-time and insecure work. So how will the Minister invest in jobs, adequate number of jobs for women in our city? I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. Uh, there is still a lot more to be done on uh, levelling the gender pay gap, and I'm delighted to announce today the next round of grants to support women who face significant barriers when returning to work. Uh, the Advisa Partnership, the Forces Employment Charity, Empower People, Westminster Council, the Shapriza Programme, Beam and Liverpool Council are some of the grant uh, uh, awardees and they will create opportunities for the most disadvantaged women in our society to achieve their full potential. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Climate change is not gender neutral. It will impact the poorest countries of the world most and exacerbate inequalities there. So will the Secretary of State for Women and Equalities join me in congratulating the Prime Minister on making sure that our country is the first in the world to legislate net zero? 
this is an incredibly important issue and it plays into all of the factors which determine uh, uh, women and girls around the world being able to reach their full potential. And I'm extremely proud that it is that our Prime Minister, a female Prime Minister, who has been the UN Secretary General's resilience champion on climate change and has taken this forward. Speaker, can she tell us how many women hold senior rank in the UK Armed Forces and what she intends to do to increase the number of women holding rank, in, high rank in uh, the Armed Forces? Uh, well, I have um, committed myself uh, to this cause in, um, in ways that uh, perhaps previous uh, Defence Secretaries have not, by wearing a uniform myself. Yeah. Been considerable progress. There will be some statistics out tomorrow, which the honour I would uh, refer the honourable lady to, which will be very encouraging uh, in this respect. We now have women on all the boards of all three services, uh, and uh, I'm hoping to make some further announcements on that uh, shortly. Harrelson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister join me? in welcoming the fact that the UK was recently announced one of the best places in the world for female entrepreneurship under the Dell scorecard. Well, I join uh, my honourable friend in welcoming the fact that this is a great place for women, indeed everyone, to do business. This is one of the challenges facing us in our new future outside the European Union. And with women like us in our country, we have a very bright future indeed. Good man. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Women who are in a car crash are 17 per cent more likely to die than men. So will the department look at a legal requirement on car manufacturers to have dummies which are female to test the cars. The Honourable Lady makes an extremely good point and I will take this up with the relevant department. Maggie through. What step is my right honourable friends taking to support women facing multiple barriers on return to work after taking time out for caring duties? Um, well, in addition to the returners programme that we have uh, announced today, we have also ring-fenced some of that money and uh, some additional funding of £100,000 to particular areas for women facing uh, immense barriers to getting into work or who may have never worked but wish to do so, including uh, learning English. Uh, which they have previously not had the chance to Thank you, Mr Speaker. The suspects who have been arrested in relation to the vicious and horrific attack on a same-sex couple on a bus in Camden last month are secondary-age children. Does the Secretary of State appreciate the link between sex and relationships education in schools and the prevention of LGBT hate crime? And what is she doing to ensure that schools across the country can teach the new curriculum in line with the law without fear of intimidation? Well, uh, I'm sure the whole House shares our concern at the recent events we have seen, not just in London but in Southampton. We are clear that this is, as I've said before, a modern, diverse society, which is precisely why we're introducing relationship and sex education to schools across the country to ensure our children learn tolerance and understanding. Primilla. Domestic abuse and modern day slavery are two issues that disproportionately affect women. Will my right honourable friend join me in thanking the Prime Minister for everything she has done to improve the legislation in this area and to help those women affected by these issues to have a better prospect, a better future in their lives? It is my very great privilege to uh, very much agree with my, my right honourable friend and I thank her in turn for all the work she has done recently scrutinising the uh, domestic abuse bill. But I do thank the Prime Minister for all of her commitment to women's issues uh, in terms of domestic abuse and modern slavery. Only yesterday I was at an event, an important event, where we were discussing the impact of domestic abuse on male victims and uh, people in that room said to me they would like me to pass the message to the Prime Minister of their thanks for everything she has done to put women on the agenda of this country and of this government. Yeah. Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Closed question, Mr Michael Fabricant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question number one, sir. Great. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And before I answer my honourable friend's question, 
Friday marks two years since the devastating Grenfell Tower fire. The survivors and bereaved, many of whom lost everything, have endured so much with such dignity. Our highest priority has been to ensure the survivors receive the support they need, and we must learn all we can to make sure no one ever has to go through their experience again. Mr Speaker, this week is also Carers' Week. This gives all of us the opportunity to pay tribute to the enormous contribution that paid and unpaid carers make to our society. Now, turning to my honourable friend's question, I met the Mayor during my visit to the King's Norton headquarters of the ADI Group. This was an excellent opportunity to see a successful West Midlands company doing its part to give young people a career. And yesterday's job figures show that not only has employment risen by over 300,000 in the West Midlands since 2010, this is something to be celebrated. Can I also uh, celebrate my honourable friend's birthday today? and that of the Mayor of the West Midlands, who I believe had a birthday yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Fabricant. Uh, may I associate myself with my right honourable friend's That's earlier true. comments, <laughs> if not the birthday greetings for which I <laughs> thank her. The West Midlands was the very first region in the country to launch its industrial strategy, and I think it actually is the best regional industrial strategy. Look, as this strategy is a shared endeavour between the region and the government, what further help can she give and the government give to realise its full potential? Well, can I say, my honourable friend is absolutely right to highlight the government's industrial strategy and to recognise the shared work that goes into those industrial strategies between government and the region and business. And uh, we will be investing £20 million towards this region becoming the UK's first future mobility zone. That will be introducing new technologies to encourage more seamless and efficient journeys, investing up to £50 million to put the region at the forefront of 5G developments as a new innovative home to the UK's first multi-city 5G testbed, and £332 million from the Government's Transforming Cities Fund to extend the city region's metro system. It's this shared vision for inclusive growth that shows how we can reach our potential and do, say, do so in a way that benefits all communities. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, uh, today would have been the 90th birthday of Anne Frank had she survived but died in the Nazi Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in 1945. In her diary she wrote many things but one of them that I think really does apply to all of us at all times is human greatness does not lie in wealth or power but in character and goodness and I think we should remember her life and all that she's inspired in so many others ever since the Second World War. <clears throat> Later this week uh, I'll be join joining those families and survivors commemorating the second anniversary of the Grenfell fire in which dozens of people died. As Sunday's fire in the flats in Barking reminds us there is still much more to do to ensure that people are safe in their homes in all parts of this country. As is traditional, Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will join me in welcoming the new member for Peterborough, my honourable friend who's sitting behind me today. Yeah. The country, Mr Speaker, is in crisis over Brexit. Manufacturing is in crisis. The Prime Minister's government has brought us to this point. And now the Conservative Party is once again in the process of foisting a new Prime Minister on the country without the country having a say through a general election. Yeah. This Prime Minister created the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in July 2016. Has the Prime Minister actually delivered an industrial strategy since then? Can I, can I first of all? Can I first of all echo the comments of the right honourable gentleman in recognising what would have been the 90th birthday of Anne Frank? Uh, nobody can have read the testimony of Anne Frank in her diary without being deeply moved and deeply shocked by what she had to live through. And that is, it seems to me, another reason why everybody across this House and across our society should do everything we can in the fight against anti-Semitism. Yeah. Can I also take, this is my first opportunity to welcome the new Honourable Member for Peterborough to her seat in this, uh, in this chamber. 
The oh, right honourable gentleman mentioned the uh, business department and industrial strategy. Well, it's quite obvious he'd written his question before he heard the answer <laughs> to the question from my honourable friend, the member for uh, Lichfield, which of course referred not only to our national industrial strategy but also to our regional industrial strategies, which are making a real difference in creating oh, yeah. the record levels of employment that we see in this country. Well, Mr Speaker, the answer she gave was a sort of unreality about it all, really. <laughs> Since... <laughs> let, let me explain. Let me explain. I'm trying to help you. If, they, if the members opposite could contain their excitement for a moment, I just thought I'd remind them that since 2016, when the Bayes Department was set up, the Labour Force survey shows that there are 147,000 147, fewer people working in manufacturing in Britain. Apprenticeship starts... Apprenticeship starts are down by 25% and manufacturing output fell by 3.9% in March and April this year, the largest fall for two decades. In the last year, Jaguar Land Rover, Honda, Vauxhall, Ford and Nissan have all announced UK job losses. Does the Prime Minister think her Department for Industrial Strategy has been good for that industry? say to the right honourable gentleman that I think this reveals an awful lot about him and the Labour Party's approach to this, these issues. The point of the industrial strategy is to make sure that we have the economy with the jobs of the future. And that is why it is good to see that in that industrial strategy we have key challenges such as artificial intelligence and data, which will underpin the work we're doing in clean growth, in mobility, in the health service, as well as so much more. On Monday, I was pleased to attend London Tech Week, to speak at London Tech Week, to do a roundtable with tech businesses in this country, to welcome the uni tech unicorn developed in London, the five tech unicorns developed in Manchester, and to welcome the over £1 billion of investment in the tech sector in this country that was announced at that time. We are looking to the jobs of the future. That's where the high-skilled, high-paid jobs are, and that's what this government is delivering. Mr Speaker, last week Ford announced it would end production at its Bridge End plant. UK car production has been virtually cut in half in the last 11 consecutive months. Ford has also said that a no-deal Brexit would put a further 6,000 UK jobs at risk, with thousands more at risk in the supply chain. Nissan, Toyota, BMW and JLR have all said similar. Will the Prime Minister take this opportunity to reiterate her government's assessment that a no-deal Brexit would be disastrous for Britain. I think some of her colleagues behind her and alongside her need reminding of that. Can I say, first of all, to the right honourable gentleman, obviously the issue of the announcement by Ford is very worrying and it's an uncertain time for workers and their families in Bridge End. Ford have committed to supporting employees throughout the consultation process and beyond, including with redeployment opportunities to other Ford sites in the UK. But the, uh, my right honourable friend, the Business Secretary, and my right honourable friend, the Welsh Secretary, have spoken to Ford, and we're working closely with them, with the Welsh Government. I spoke to the, uh, the First Minister of Wales, spoke to me as well on these issues, and working with local stakeholders and trade union representatives to ensure that those skilled and valued workers are supported throughout this process. The right honourable the gentleman then goes on to talk about no deal and, and uh, his concerns about a no deal, uh, a no deal situation. Can I just say uh, it would it would come a little bit more sincerely from him if he hadn't gone through the lobbies regularly and consistently voting to increase the chances of no deal by voting against the deal. The prime minister may not have noticed, but her deal was rejected three times by Parliament. Mr Speaker, another industry failed by the UK Government is that of UK Steel. Why didn't the Government agree a deal to support our steel industry? Can I, can I just say to the right honourable gentleman, I think the point he makes is exactly the point that I was making, which is the fact that, I mean, had the right honourable gentleman really believed 
that we should be leaving the European Union and doing it with a deal, then he would have voted for the deal. We could have left the European Union and actually we could be on to that brighter future already. We did work with British Steel. We worked with its owner, Grable Capital, and lenders to explore all the potential options to secure a solution for British Steel. Uh, and as shown through the ETS agreement that the government uh, put in place, we were willing to act. Uh, we continue to work with the official receiver and with the British Steel support group that's management trade unions and with companies in the supply chain and local communities to pursue every possibility, every st possible step to secure the future of the valuable operations in sites at Scunthorpe, at uh, Skinning Grove and on Teesside. And I myself will be meeting a group of members of parliament from the uh, region uh, for, whose constituencies are affected later today. Well, since the government did nothing to protect the steel industry in Redcar, I hope they're going to do a bit better on Scunthorpe, where 5,000 jobs are at risk. The Bay Select Committee raises questions about whether the government actually entered into the negotiations in good faith. Another sector, Mr. Speaker, that has been another sector that has been failed by the government is that of the renewables industry. Solar installations are down by 94 per cent. Onshore wind coming to a grinding halt and they failed to back the very important, very exciting and innovative Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon. They're failing on cars, on steel and on renewables. I know the Tory leadership candidates have been falling over themselves to confess to their past indulgences, but can the Prime Minister name, it, name an industry that is legal, that our government industry ministers have actually backed? <laughs> gentlemen, he talks about solar power. Let's actually look at the facts. 99% of solar power deployed in the UK has been deployed under a Conservative yeah. government. Yeah. Last year, renewables generated a record amount of electricity. This is indeed a record that this government can be proud of. But while he's talking about renewables, I'm very surprised the Right Honourable Gentleman hasn't taken the opportunity to stand up and thank this Government for our announcement today that we are going to legislate for net zero on emissions by 2050. Mr Speaker, the legacy of her Government is one of failure. They claimed they would tackle burning injustices. They failed. They told pensioners their benefits were safe. Now they're taking away the TV licences for the over 75s. They, they promised action. They promised action on Grenfell two years on. There is still flammable cladding on thousands of homes across this country. They promised a northern powerhouse. They failed to deliver it. And every northern newspaper is campaigning for this government to power up the north. They promised net zero by 2050. Yet they failed on renewables and are missing. Order! The right honourable gentleman won't be shouted down. It isn't going to happen. Don't waste your breath. It's not productive and it's terribly boring. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, they promised net zero by 2050, yet they failed on renewables and are missing their climate change targets. They promised an industrial strategy. Output is falling. So which does the Prime Minister see as the biggest industrial failure of her government? The car industry, the steel industry or the renewables industry? Which is it? Can I just say, I just say to the right honourable gentleman, he can pose for his YouTube clip as much as he likes. But, but let's, let's actually look at what this government has delivered. What we have delivered is a racial disparity audit that deals with the inappropriate inequality of public services for people from different communities, record investment in transport infrastructure in the north, a record employment rate, lowest unemployment for 45 years, wages growing faster than inflation, a record cash boost for the NHS, better mental health support, more homes being built, stamp duty cut, higher standards in our schools and leading the world 
on climate change. That's, that's a record of Conservatives in government that we are proud of, and we will never let him destroy it. the Prime Minister on introducing legislation for net zero. Yeah, yeah. It is a fantastic achievement and we can all be proud that we are passing on the planet in a better state to yeah, our children. Yeah. But does she agree with me that whoever follows her at this dispatch box, and I know some of them may be sitting here this morning, they must place policies to achieve this at the heart of their programme yeah, yeah, government. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, can I, can I uh, thank my hon. Friend for her words? I'm very proud that we are committing to end our contribution to uh, ensure that we make our contribution to dealing with climate change by laying the legislation for a net zero target by 2050 today. This puts us on the path to become the first major economy to set a net zero emissions target in law. Once again, this is the United Kingdom leading on this issue of tackling climate change, and this is delivering on the Conservative promise to leave the environment in a better state for the next generation. And I, this is about long-term climate targets. We are proud of the world-leading record we have, but I absolutely agree that it is vital that we continue this work and make sure that we protect our planet for generations to come. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is right that we mark the 90th birthday of what would have been Anne Frank's birthday today. Of course, a young woman who got her diary for her 13th birthday. We should never forget the trials and the tribulations of those that paid the utmost price under the genocide and the genocides which have followed since then. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, an attack on women's rights. Tax breaks for the rich, paid for by raising national insurance in Scotland. Closing down Parliament in order to ensure that a catastrophic no-deal Brexit can be imposed. Does the Prime Minister think that any of these policies are respectable, never mind acceptable? Yeah. I say to the right honourable gentleman, the time will come and he will be able to answer my to ask my successor questions at this dispatch box. But he raises he raises the issue of people uh, are paying in Scotland. I have to remind him there's only one party in Scotland that has a policy to ensure that people in Scotland pay more tax, and that's the Scottish Nationalists. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You would have thought after the time that the Prime Minister spent at the dispatch box, she would realise she's supposed to at least try and answer the question. <laughs> the state of politics in this place is humiliating. The Tory leadership race is a total horror show. The EU was clear use the time wisely. And yet the Tories are obsessing with themselves at the expense of people across these islands. Just when we thought that things couldn't get any worse, they're even lurching further to the extremes. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister once described her party as the nasty party. Well, with candidates like the one announcing today, it is about to get a whole lot nastier. Does the Prime Minister agree that the fantasy fairy stories of the Tory party's candidates are nothing more than an assault on our common sense? And tonight, will she vote? to stop any no-deal madness. Yeah. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, first of all, the motion that is on the table tonight is about whether or not the Government should hand control of business in this House to the Labour Party and the Scottish National Party. Yeah. And that is something we will not do. Can I also say to the right honourable gentleman, he talks about the need to use, he talks about the need to use this time wisely. Well, he could have been using the time wisely. Had he voted for the deal we negotiated with the European Union, we'd have left the European Union and we'd be out with an orderly exit. Mr. Peter Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister has led the fight against human trafficking and modern-day slavery. Uh, her Modern Slavery Act has led the way in Europe. There are more prosecutions and convictions of traffickers now. However, the scourge of human trafficking continues worldwide. Prime Minister, your efforts in ending human trafficking have been superb. 
What efforts have you been able to make to encourage other leaders to follow your example? Well, can, I, can I thank my honourable friend for his question and also for the work that he has done uh, over the years on this particular issue. I was very pleased to be at the ILO conference in Geneva last night and to speak about our campaign against modern slavery, but also to recognise that 90 countries have now signed up to the call for action against modern slavery uh, that, we launched, that I launched in the United Nations, uh, that we see other countries following our legislative example, the Dutch Senate recently, for example, Australia as well. We have seen President uh, Buhari in Nigeria uh, showing great leadership across sub-Saharan Africa on this issue. And I'm very pleased to see the impact that the Modern Slavery Act has had, such that we have seen a British citizen being convicted in British courts for trafficking, for being part of a gang that trafficked Nigerian women to Germany, despite the fact that none of that crime touched the UK. She was a British citizen. She was prosecuted here thanks to our Modern Slavery Act. We're streeting. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the event that a Prime Minister asks Her Majesty the Queen to prorogue Parliament against the express wishes of a majority of the House of Commons, whose advice would the Queen be obliged to follow? The advice of her Prime Minister or the express will of this House? Everyone knows I will not stand at this dispatch box and speak about decisions that Her Majesty the Queen might make. Uh, what, I, what I would say is that we see a situation tonight in a motion, uh, this afternoon in a motion, where the Labour Party and the SNP are trying to take control away from the government of the business of this House. Governments, governments are able to govern. Governments are able to govern by having control of the business of this House, and that's what everybody should recall. You merriman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, last week, I had the privilege to meet uh, my 109-year-old constituent, Mrs. May Willis, still living independently in Bex Hill. She asked me to pass on her sentiments to the Prime Minister. So, from one May to another, uh, as it were. Um, she asked me to express how much she admires the Prime Minister's dedication to public service and everything she has done in putting her country first, and regrets the Prime Minister has been let down by people in this place. Sentiments I share. She's concerned about democracy, and I know the Prime Minister loathes this concept, but both the Prime Minister and I have voted three times for her deal and also to keep no deal on the table. At what point in time? Will we need to put this back to the people to finally deliver Brexit? Can I first of all ask my honourable friend to pass my best wishes and thanks on to May uh, for her comments and to congratulate her on, uh, on a long life and uh, uh, for the interest that she has shown in politics and in what is happening in this country. Uh, on the second part of the uh, question that my honourable friend raised, can I simply say to him I have not changed my mind. I believe that we should be working to deliver on the result of the first referendum where we gave the people the choice, they chose to leave the EU. I, I continue to believe we should do that with a deal because I think that's the best interest for this country. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, this uh, log-jammed and underworked Parliament could become one of the best if we chose to work across party to fix our broken social care system. Through free votes, goodwill and hard work, we could both design and then enact a new deal for social care that would bring hope for the future to millions. So in this last few weeks that she has as Prime Minister, will she agree to meet with me and to establish a cross-party group so that we could bring this social care new deal to fruition? I say to the uh, right honourable gentleman that uh, we do indeed need to ensure that we can see a sustainable future for our social care system. That is why, at the earliest opportunity, the government will bring forward a social care green paper and it will be open to all across this House to be able to contribute to the consideration of that. Stephen Crabb. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister share the growing sense of alarm, both in Hong Kong and internationally, at the potentially destructive effects of its new extradition law on civil liberties in Hong Kong? And does the Prime Minister further agree that we in the United Kingdom have a special obligation to Hong Kong and we should never be fearful about speaking up for freedom values on the island? Yeah. Well, can, I, can I say to my right honourable friend that this is an important issue. Uh, we are concerned about the potential effects of these proposals, particularly obviously given the large number of British citizens there are in Hong Kong. But it is vital that those extradition arrangements in Hong Kong are in line with the rights and freedoms that were set down in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. 
We have been unequivocal in our views. We have been very clear uh, from the outset that uh, in engaging with the Hong Kong government, with the members of the Hong Kong Legislative Council and the Executive Council at all levels about our opinion, uh, our view on this issue. As I say, it is vital that those extradition arrangements are in line with the rights and freedoms that were set down in that Sino-British joint. The Prime Minister has always said that she believes in fairness. So can I ask her, would it be fair to have a taxation policy which massively benefits by introducing tax cuts for the top and richest 10% in our country? What is her answer to that? Does she think that's fair? Say, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, what I think is fair is what this Government is doing, which is under this Government we have seen the top 1% paying more in income tax than they ever did under a Labour Government. And what's more, we have been delivering tax cuts. Over 3 million people taken out of paying income tax altogether and over 30 million people with a tax cut. That's what's fair. It's more money in people's pockets. That's what we as Conservatives have done for people. Andrew Griffiths. The Prime Minister will remember that just two months ago I raised the case of Nicola Morgan Dingley. Uh, Nicola was 36, she was a marathon runner, she was a fit and healthy woman when she was diagnosed with uh, triple negative breast cancer. Just two weeks ago she came and saw the Health Secretary to talk about what more could be done to help women suffering from breast cancer. Sadly, on Sunday, Nicola lost her battle. Um, will the, uh, charities such as Breast Cancer Now are demanding that women in families where there is a history of breast cancer should have access to uh, testing earlier. Will the Prime Minister leave a real legacy by ensuring that those women uh, uh, have the opportunity to beat cancer in the future by having testing earlier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can, I, can I first of all extend my deepest condolences? to Nicholas' family and friends, uh, it is that the news that my honourable friend has brought to this House is indeed terrible news, and I'm sorry uh, that we uh, have seen this happen, so, particularly so shortly after Nicola was able to speak with the Health Secretary. I will uh, look at this issue with the Health Secretary. One of the uh, uh, benefits of the 10-year plan that we're putting in place and the cash boost we're giving to the National Health Service is to be able to put more emphasis on early diagnosis. And I think this is so important, and this is an element that we will certainly want to look at. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome this Prime Minister's announcement to commit to net zero, but this doesn't go far or fast enough. It must include aviation and shipping, and it mustn't shift our problem to developing nations through offsetting. When will we see the urgent and radical steps needed? to address this climate emergency. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, to the Honourable Lady, that we are taking what for many is, will be seen as a radical step, as a very key step in dealing with this, uh, with this issue. We have been making good progress as a government over the years. I think it is important that we give this commitment, but I also want to see, because you know, we are not, we're about 2% of uh, of uh, reckon about two percent of this problem across the world. What is important is that others follow our lead, and that is what we will be working to see. Tory apprentice. Mr. Yeah, Speaker, yeah, yeah. there can be little doubt that this Prime Minister knows what a feminist looks like, yeah, yeah. and I would like to thank her for all she has done to progress equality. Yeah, yeah. Does she agree with me that there is still a long way to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can I say? Can I thank my honourable friend for her? Comments, but can I also say that I do agree that there is still a long way to go, and that is why we continue to take action. That's why my right honourable friend, the uh, Minister for Women and Equalities, is continuing to look at what more government can do to help women, women in the workplace, uh, to help women with their responsibilities, and ensure that we do see women able to take their full place in our society, and that actually, as a country, we are able to benefit from the enormous talents that lie in our female population. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister knows I've tracked her impressive career for, for 22 years from a June day when I heard her maiden speech. But could I say to her today, could I ask her a question, will she change her mind about cutting and running? With her integrity, 
her experience, indeed, can I say her moral cap compass, mm. this, de this parliamentary democracy is in crisis. Why can't she stay here, even come on the back benches, and give some of the people that will take over after her a bit of the medicine that she, they've given her? <laughs> well, can I, can I, can I just say, uh, the Honourable Gentleman refers to my staying here. I will indeed be staying in the Chamber of the House of Commons because I will continue as a Member of Parliament for my constituency. Uh, uh, but can I also say I am a woman of my word. I gave my word to my party as to what I would do, and I stand by that word. But I am also very tempted to say to the Honourable Gentleman that, of course, we might not be in this position. He says he doesn't want us to be in this position. We would not be in this position if he had voted for the deal. Sir Oliver Hill. In the light of yesterday's Charity Commission report and today's report by the Oxfam Independent Commission, does the Prime Minister agree with me that there is a role for government and other major donors in ensuring and enabling a strong ethical structure for the whole aid sector, good governance, and to ensure that, as well as doing good, these important bodies do no harm? <coughs> Can I, can I say to my right honourable friend, he's raised a very important issue, and this is one which uh, the former International Development Secretary, my right honourable friend, took action on immediately when it first became uh, public that, that there were these concerns about the actions of NGOs. And uh, she and the UK have led the way on this. And I know that my right honourable friend, the current International Development Secretary, is looking very closely at this report and at what further action we can take. And the action that we have taken as a UK is not just about our interaction with NGOs. We have brought the international community together to look at that issue and we will continue to lead yeah, on this. Yeah, yeah. I'll turn, uh, on the 16th of May last year, the Prime Minister said she wanted a speedy resolution to the row between Vertex and NHS England for the cystic of fibrosis treatment or Canby. And I know that the Prime Minister is aware of my seven-year-old constituent, Oliver Ward, who wrote to her recently in his letter, he pleaded with the Prime Minister, saying, why am I still waiting? I need these medicines before I get too sick. Will the Prime Minister please meet with him and his mother, Emma, to discuss what she can do personally to end this burning injustice so that Ollie and other CF sufferers can live long and healthy lives. Yeah. Well, can I first of all say to the Honourable Gentleman, he has indeed raised this issue with me previously, and our thoughts, my thoughts, and those I'm sure of the whole House are with Oliver and, his, and with his mum, Emma. I understand my right honourable friend, the Health Secretary, has in fact written to the honourable gentleman this morning about this issue. We have seen it is obviously we have the uh, um, process whereby uh, NHS England look at these uh, look at these issues. I understand NHS England have made a revised and improved offer to Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Vertex should have heard the concerns that have been raised, the very real case studies that have been raised by members in this House. I believe Vertex should now accept the offer NHS England has put on the table so that this drug does become available to Oliver and others. John Stevenson. Mr Speaker. Uh, Prime Minister, until recently the probate registry has provided an excellent service. This is not now the case. There are very extensive delays due to proposed rationalisation, new technology being introduced and the prospects of increased probate fees. This poor service is causing practitioners difficulties and distress to families due to the loss of house sales. Can she therefore um, do everything, everything to ensure that this service improves rapidly and can she also confirm that the proposed probate fee increases will now be withdrawn? I say to my honourable friend that I recognise the concern which uh, the situation that he's described in terms of the delays in dealing with these issues must be causing many people. I will ensure that the relevant minister looks very carefully at this issue in response to my honourable friend. Sir David Crosby. Yeah. Yeah. The people of Bolton have suffered years and years of a dreadful train service made worse by Northern Rail and not helped by the Department for Transport. Now, in some respects, uh, Mr Speaker, it's sad to see the uh, Prime Minister stepping down, but as she's going anyway, could she please take the Secretary of State for Transport with her? <laughs> <laughs> and devolve, and devolve the running of Northern trains to the North. Yeah. 
can I say to the honourable gentleman, we have been clear, I have said it, and the Secretary of State has said it, the performance in the North uh, is, uh, is unacceptable, has been unacceptable. The performance we saw following those timetable changes um, on the 18th of May last year. Uh, and passengers in the North do deserve better. That's why we are working closely with a variety of organisations, Network Rail, Northern, Transparent Island Express and Transport for the North to improve services and punctuality. But we've also appointed an industry expert, Richard George, to look at this issue, to review the performance and make recommendations to improve reliability. And we, w that should drive improvements, but we won't hesitate to take the action necessary. Thomas. Mr Speaker, when I meet constituents over 75 years old in my constituency, I see a lifetime of contribution to our economy, our society and Great Britain. Can the Prime Minister do anything at all to reverse this decision to take away their free TV licence? Well, can I say to, the, uh, to my honourable friend that I believe that the BBC actually got a good deal in 2015. Indeed, uh, the government's decision here to put the cost of the over 75s on the BBC has been more than matched by the deal coming back for the BBC. Those aren't my words, those were the words of the Director General of the BBC after the deal in 2015. And I think taxpayers now expect the BBC to do the right thing. Grim West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In February 2018, tragically, a homeless man died outside Parliament. Ten months later, another homeless man died in exactly the same place. Will the Prime Minister deal with this terrible Dickensian situation? And in the dying days of her Premiership, will she address this burning injustice of homelessness where we have to step over the bodies to enter Parliament? Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that, of course, we are all concerned about the issues of homelessness, about the issues of rough sleeping, and all concerned when we uh, hear and see the stories that she has quoted. Uh, the latest figures on rough sleeping actually show that the number of people sleeping on our streets is down for the first time in eight years. That's because the action has been taken. Uh, it's a step in the right direction, but of course there is much more that we need to do. And that's why we've set up the new strategy to end rough sleeping altogether, which is backed by an initial £100 million. We're determined to make sleeping on the streets a thing of the past. Joe Brereton. Mr Speaker, would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, agree with me that for families who've worked hard all their lives to own their own home, like many people in Stoke on Trent South, we must resist Labour's attempts to threaten their livelihoods yeah. with a pernicious land tax on their homes. Yeah. 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 I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. Sadly, this is an idea that the Labour Party has brought forward in the past. We rejected it wholeheartedly in the past. We must continue to reject it. As my honourable friend says, as my honourable friend says, many people have worked hard in his constituency and others to ha achieve that dream of owning their own home, and we should be supporting them. Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many people who are responsibly recycling plastic are unaware that these supposedly recycled materials have actually been shipped to the developing world where they are stockpiled or burned. Um, the Prime Minister has talked tough on climate change. Will she now leave a true legacy as an environmental champion and follow Canada's lead in banning single-use plastic? Yeah. 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 Actually, this government has been taking a lead in single-use plastics. We have been taking action in relation to plastics. I am pleased to say that we are also encouraging other countries around the world. The alliance we have with a number of countries in the Commonwealth on this issue is also seeing action being taken. We are particularly uh, concerned for small island states in relation to marine plastic. So we will continue in the fight against single-use plastic, uh, and, uh, but this government has a record to be proud of. Ellen Waitley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Our National Health Service is brilliant because of the people who work in it. The new People Plan recognises that and the importance of investing in the training of staff and truly valuing staff from the top to the bottom of the NHS. Will my right hon. Friend do all she can to make sure that it is put into practice so our constituents get the health care that they need and they want? Well, my hon. Friend is absolutely right to recognise the uh, fact that our NHS depends on the excellent excellent people that we have working within it. And I'd like to thank everybody, all the staff across the NHS for all they do day in and day out. 
I think this people plan is a very important uh, opportunity to take action now and over the long term to meet the challenges of supply, of reform, culture and leadership and make the NHS a better place to work. Now, the interim plan set out a, a number of practical steps that the NHS will now take to increase the supply of clinical staff. But, and a final people plan will be published after the spending review. This is a very important element of the 10-year plan for the NHS, and I wholeheartedly support the efforts that are being make, made to improve the NHS as a place to work for the staff. Bryant, when researchers recently screened all the women prisoners at Drake Hall Prison in Staffordshire for um, brain injuries, they found that nearly two-thirds had had a serious brain injury before they committed their first offence and that of those injuries, two-thirds were the result of domestic violence. So the real danger is that we're criminalising the victims of domestic abuse. Now, there's a domestic abuse bill going through pre-legislative scrutiny at the moment. Wouldn't it be a good idea if we changed that, added a clause in it to say that all female prisoners will be screened for brain injury, that all female prisoners who've had a brain injury will have proper neuro-rehabilitation so that we can rescue their futures, so that we prevent crime in the future. And if she's got some spare time, could she, could she co-sign that amendment with me, perhaps as vice chair of the all-party group on acquired brain injury? Can I, can I say to the uh, honourable gentleman that uh, this issue of brain injury for prisoners is one that we do take very seriously and indeed action is being taken by the Ministry of Justice to look very carefully into, uh, into this issue. Obviously I look forward to the debate that will take place. Uh, well, well, I've, I've had many invitations across this chamber in the, uh, in the past. I've never quite had this invitation from the honourable gentleman in, uh, in uh, the past. I have to say to him I think it is an invitation uh, to uh, work with him that I will approach Approach with caution, given some of the arguments we've had in the past. But I look with, I look with, um, you know, uh, I welcome the fact that I will be able to contribute to the debate on that bill, or expect to be able to contribute to the debate on that bill when it goes through this House. It's a very important piece of legislation, which I want to see genuinely transforming what we can do to deal with domestic violence. Yeah. John Barron, whilst recognising that cancer survival rates are at their highest in this country, it also remains an inconvenient truth that we are failing to close the gap with international averages. And as a result, ten, the last government estimate suggested 10,000 lives are being needlessly lost because we're failing to close that gap. When she has the discussions with her health secretary, I know she recognises the importance of early diagnosis. But would she look at a key recommendation of the all-party group on cancer and many others in the sector of putting the key one-year outcome indicator into the heart of our cancer strategy because the only way you can improve your one-year figures is to diagnose earlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is an issue on which my honourable friend has been campaigning long and hard, and I, I congratulate him for, for the passion with which he has done so. Um, it is right, as I said earlier, that in the 10-year plan for the NHS, that early diagnosis, early diagnosis is one of the elements, and particularly around certain uh, aspects of cancer. Uh, they are looking very carefully at what can be done to ensure that early diagnosis. So I'm sure they will look at the proposal that my honourable friend has put forward. Austin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We've got ambitious plans uh, for Dudley with a new technical skills centre to provide technical apprenticeships and university level skills in industries like advanced manufacturing, digital technologies, uh, low carbon industries and autonomous electric vehicles. So before she leaves office, will she accelerate the Stronger Towns Fund and enable us to bring new investments, new industries and good new well paid jobs to the black country? Can I, can I, as, uh, I don't know whether the Honourable Gentleman will get an opportunity to ask me another question on uh, PMQs over the coming weeks, but can I take this opportunity of recognising the significant work that he has done with the Holocaust Education Trust? Yeah. And I think, uh, on the, as we recognise this would have been the 90th birthday of Anne Frank, I think it is very uh, important that we recognise the work that is done by that trust and the Honourable Gentleman's contribution to it. Yeah. He's raised the issue of the Stronger Towns Fund, and he's absolutely right. We've, we've got a notional allocation of £212 million for the West Midlands. Um, I understand that my white honourable friend, the Secretary of State, has met with the honourable gentleman to discuss the design of the fund um, when he made a recent visit to uh, Dudley. We do intend to publish a policy prospectus on the Stronger Towns Fund before the summer recess, but it is there exactly so that places like Dudley can harness their unique strengths and grow and prosper. 
Sir David Amis. Time today to look at the Ombudsman's report into mental health services in my region with its worrying criticisms of leadership failures. And if I say to my right honourable friend, I've now been involved in ten leadership parliamentary elections, so will she reflect on the fact that I will be supporting my colleague who respects the referendum result? Make South End on Sea a city and <laughs> continues to prioritise mental health services. <laughs> ten, ten leadership elections and never a candidate. I say to my old friend, he missed this opportunity once again. Um, uh, in, uh, in this, and I'm sure that all the candidates have heard, what, uh, have heard the point that he has made. I haven't had a chance to look at the Ombudsman's report. I am concerned. We have seen over the years a number of air parts of the NHS where the mental health services have not been delivering what they should be uh, delivering for individuals. It's important, as we have put mental health as a central part of what we want to see uh, uh, developing and improving in the health service in the future, that we look not only at the monies, money that is being put in, but on actually how, at local level, trusts are operating and delivering services. Well, the Honourable Gentleman might not have been candidate so far, but he's scarcely at the midpoint of his parliamentary <laughs> career, and we know not what awaits us or him in the future. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On the climate emergency, the Prime Minister will know I wanted to go further and faster, but I do congratulate her on facing down the Chancellor by legislating for net zero by 2050. But if she wants a positive climate legacy, we need words, we need deeds, not just words. So there are three things she could do in the six weeks she has left. Will she cancel the expansion of Heathrow Airport? Will she divert the money for more road building into public transport? And will she scrap fracking once and for all? That is the way she would show us she's serious. Will she do it? Prime Minister! Uh, can I say to the Honourable Lady, first of all, I welcome the fact, I did say a few weeks ago, that I hope the day would come when she would welcome action that the Government was taking on uh, 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 climate change. Uh, and thank you for her comments on, on what we have announced today. Um, uh, this was a decision taken across Government. It is supported across Government. I think it is an important decision for the future. She says, she says put into action, not just words. She will have noticed that we haven't just said that we're going to have this net zero target. We are actually introducing legislation to put that net. That is action, not just words. Thank you. Order. Statement. The Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Secretary Dr. Greg Clark. If the right honourable gentleman wishes to await